Let's remain standing to ask for his blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach us your statutes. With our lips we declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies we delight as much as in all riches. Help us to meditate on your precepts and fix our eyes on your ways. Then we will delight in your statutes and we will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servants that we may live and keep your word. Open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of your scriptures. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture uh, reading in our text is found in Hosea chapter 6. Well, we're looking at Hosea chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, but I'll start uh, reading from Hosea chapter 6, verse 11. Actually, the latter half of chapter 6, verse 11. And so you could find Hosea um, between Ezekiel and Daniel. And if you're using the Pew Bibles, uh, you could find it on page 734. No, wait, 754. And every time I get the opportunity to preach here, um, I'm always known as the Hosea guy <laughs> because I was, because I just continue where I left off from Hosea, hear more about judgment but then hope. So, so it's a good thing to come back and revisit this uh, book of not only judgments and indictments, but to hear the gospel, to hear the hope that Hosea reveals to us in his book. And so starting from Hosea chapter 6, verse 11, the latter half of verse 11, and then down to chapter 7, verse 1 to 16. When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside. But they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil they make the king glad and the princess by their treachery. They are all adulterers. They, all, they are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire. From the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princess came, became sick. With the heat of wine, he stretched out his hand with mockers. For with hearts like an oven, they approached their intrigue. All night, their anger smolders. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour the rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, sealing without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves. They rebel against me. Although I train and strengthen their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. The princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. As we dive into another episode of Hosea's book in chapter 7, we're back in Israel's history in the northern kingdom 
uh, where the prophet Hosea has been pronouncing God's prophetic word to unfaithful Israel, to a people who refuse to turn from their sin. And it's been a laundry list of indictments that began in chapter 4 to expose the various sins in great detail and the curse that awaits them if they do not return to the Lord. And though the prophet calls them to repentance in chapter 6 and call to return to the Lord, what happened was that the message fell on deaf ears. They have forsaken the Lord. They have chosen a burning passion for sin and rebellion. And so this list of indictments that continues in chapter 7, shows us that God doesn't view sin lightly. He doesn't just expose Israel's sin generally, but he also exposes sin in its many grievous forms, leaving no stone unturned. We see in verses 1 to 2, the Lord says, I remember all their evil, their iniquity, and all their evil deeds which are revealed. And what pattern do we see when the Lord remembers sin? That when he remembers sin, there is a corresponding punishment against sin. And just to be clear, the Lord isn't a God who hates people, right? The Lord delights in his creation, his creatures. He he desires to restore his people. But what he hates is their sin. Right? He created us good after his own image to be in communion with him, but he hates our sin. And why? Because sin is what separates us from him. It disorders our lives. It distorts our love for God and our neighbor. It's the curse of sin that we've inherited from Adam, that like Adam chapter 6 verse 7, that his people transgress the covenant. And sadly, our culture struggles to identify the real problem in people, right? They ask, how can an individual commit such an evil act? They ask, what's the real motive behind this person's evil? And yet God's word has always been the answer as to why man is inclined toward evil. Jesus tells us in in, in Mark chapter 7, That the evil which defiles a person is from where? It's from the heart of man. That's the main problem. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. These are all the evil that come from within that defile a person. And so, beloved, it's in our nature to hate God and neighbor as the result of the fall. God doesn't leave any stone unturned regarding sin, as we'll see in chapter 7. God already knows our sin problem, right? But notice how he takes his time in his word for us to realize that it's a matter of life and death issue. That it's a real problem in our lives. And that he wants to address the problem because he knows we often disregard it. And so our hope is that the God who can accurately assess our sin problem is the same God who can accurately provide the sure promise and ongoing renewal that we need in Jesus Christ. And so we'll see in chapter 7 the accusations revealed against Israel which reveals a burning passion for sin, which he not only exposes in a general way, but in in particularly the corruption of their leaders, for Israel's leaders, and then second, the alliances that Israel made with the pagan nations. But in light of these accusations, the main message is not for us to remain hopeless in sin, but to seek hope in Christ, beloved. That hope that since Christ rescues his people from the burning passion of sin, we can now live with the holy passion to love God and to love others the way he intended us to be. Let me repeat that. Since Christ rescues his people 
from the burning passion of sin, we can now live with the holy passion to love God and to love others the way he intended us to be. And so how can we know that hope in light of the accusations pronounced in our passage? Well, there are three things the Lord reveals uh, to his people. First, his desire to restore his people. Second, his accusations against his people. And finally, his rescue to free his people. His desire to restore his people, his accusations against his people, and finally, his rescue to free his people. And first, we see his desire to restore his people. And we see that there in the last half of verse 11 of chapter 6 and in verse 1 of chapter 7, through the prophet Hosea, the Lord says, When I restore the fortunes of my people, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed and the evil deeds of Samaria. Here we see again how the Lord is addressing Israel in the northern kingdom, which is indicated by the prominent tribe Ephraim, which is often represents the kind of whole of Israel and Samaria being the capital of, of Ephraim. And we see that even though the Lord will uh, continue to reveal his accusations against Israel, it's still the Lord who desires to restore and to heal his people. But the problem has always been their sin. And so the tension revealed in Hosea's prophecy is that how can a holy God who desires steadfast love and faithfulness with his people remain with the people who are not faithful? Who don't follow the Lord? Who after receiving the Lord's provision, the one who supplied their every need, turned again and again to dead idols and pursued rebellion. How can a relationship continue to, how can, how can this relationship continue to thrive? Because although the Lord is merciful, his justice against sins of his people cannot be overlooked. In verse 1, the Lord laments that whenever I restore them and heal them, their iniquity and evil deeds are exposed. And in verses 13 to 14, I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. This is why the Lord recounts that every time he's, it's just, he's saying, every time I demonstrate blessing to my people, there's always, there's always there that sin that gets in the way. As much as I desire communion with my people, it's always interrupted by sin. And it's Israel's sin that the Lord despises. He cannot overlook sin because it's the sin that must be punished. He says in verse 2, they do not consider that I remember all their evil. And then in verse 13, in verse 13 destruction to them for they have rebelled against me. And so imagine the prophet's struggle in dealing with this tension between God's mercy while pronouncing God's judgment. It's the people's endless sin problem and rebellion. And this is why Hosea and all the Old Testament prophets, they considered this tension and yet looked forward to the day that in the fullness of time, the Davidic king would resolve that tension on the cross. That while on this side of the cross, we have the privilege of looking back at that fulfillment, which gives us a much greater sense of God's love for us, accomplished in Jesus Christ, that through Christ's redemptive work, our communion with God is no longer hindered by sin. And why? Because I like, as one theologian beautifully said, it was there on the cross that God's holy justice was satisfied, while at the same time His gracious love was displayed. So isn't that amazing, beloved? That tension is resolved in Jesus Christ where his holy justice was satisfied and his gracious love was displayed. So beloved, not only does the Lord desire restoration for his people in our passage, but he must also continue to reveal his accusations against his people. And it's under this point that God's word through the prophet 
will bring forth uh, these series of accusations uh, primarily against Israel's political corruption, which we see in verses 3 to 7, and Israel's alliances with pagan nations in verses 8 to 16. And as we read there, as we, as we, come, as we uh, read this and see this unfold before us, these accusations unfold, the prophet will uh, compare unfaithful, unfaithful Israel uh, to these everyday images to better describe their unfaithfulness. Right? Images which we'll later see like a hot oven or a half-baked cake, a dove or a bow. And so it's interesting as we'll see that how he's going to communicate how it um, reflects Israel's unfaithfulness. And so the exposure of their sin unfolds in verse 1 by listing evil deeds, which he's already revealed in chapter 4, like lying, stealing, bandits that come together to rob people. And then in verses 3 to 7, the Lord focuses his accusation against Israel's political disorder. Right, where he exposes conspirators who instigate corruption. We read in verse 3, By their evil, they make the king glad, and the princess by their treachery or lies. Now, we're not told who specifically conspired um, evil by making the king glad, nor who that Israel, Israelite king is, but it's evident in Israel's history during Hosea's time that there were many who were corrupt in, in the politics of Israel to have personal gain. Many were uh, power hungry to be on the throne even if it ended up deceiving and assassinating a rival king. We can think of King Pekahiah's captain named Pekah in 2 Kings chapter 15 who conspired against Pekahiah by assassinating him so that now he too could be king. But as you can imagine where this goes. But then after Pekah became king, we're told another Hosea conspired to take Pekah down from his throne. And so the cycle goes on and on, plotting evil against one another. And that's what the Lord brings to light in the heart of man, doesn't it? The deception, the evil, the conspiracies of those who think their evil deeds can be covered up. And the Lord calls them out in verse 4 saying that they are all adulterers, right? Perhaps in relation to their overall spiritual whoredom in the land. But what's next is that the prophet introduces to us an image by comparing Israel's corrupt politics to a heated oven in the next several verses. We see, we read there in verse 4, they are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's until it leaving. And in verses 6 to 7, for with hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue or conspiracy. And all night their anger smolders, or in other words, it burns. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. And so comparing Israel's sin to a heated oven it's easy to imagine because as you start the fire over time, the temperature in the oven increases. And in the same way, the heat of Israel's sin within its political corruption had increased over time with deception, jealousy, anger, murder, in which their sin was already blazing out of control to the point that they were devouring one another. And so it's no wonder why Israel's rulers assassinated one after another, because it's a picture, it's a picture of how feeding our sinful desires can turn into a passion to seek more and more in which more sin is never enough. And this is perhaps one of the darkest times in Israel's history. In verse 7, the Lord reveals Israel's political extinction as a result of this, in which he says, all their kings have fallen and none of them calls upon me. Right? We here we see the Lord's lament that Israel's, Israel's rulers have completely forgotten the Lord. 
But not only do we see the Lord's accusation against Israel's political corruption, we see also his complaint against Israel's alliances with the pagan nation. We see in verse 8 that Ephraim mixes himself with the people. In other words, when Israel mixes itself with the pagan nations, uh, God's people are no longer seen as a holy nation that reflect the holiness of God. We read in Psalm 106, 34, 35, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. See that? And so in the same way, beloved, beloved, as believers who live in a culture that's increasingly anti-Christian, you know, the lesson here is that we must not be tempted to be like the world. Especially when the church is attempted uh, to accommodate to the culture without biblical warrant, but to just simply fit in. And I think the mandate in the new covenant to avoid compromise is even greater especially among believers who are united to Christ and united to believers who have received the gospel of truth, which is the power of God for salvation. So to compromise the gospel that we now have would be a great sin. And so another image that's compared to Israel's compromise in verse 8 is like we read there, a cake not turned. In other words, it's like a cake that was uh, placed in the oven, which was not evenly turned, and so it ended up half-baked, right? One one side is cooked, and the other side is raw and and mushy, and so it's not really edible. That's, That's what compromise looks like. You're not one, you're not the other, but you simply mix with the world, becoming indistinguishable from God's people. And in verse 9, because Israel pursues compromise, they become unaware that the pagan nations that they mix with devour their strength away. And like an old man growing gray, they become weaker. And yet in verse 10, we see that despite their slow decay as a nation, they remain prideful, refusing to return to the Lord nor seek Him for all this. But not only do we see the image of a cake half-baked, but we see in verse 11 that Israel is compared to a dove, right? For she is like a dove, silly without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. And as one commentator points out, Israel is like a dove who is fickle-minded. She goes back and forth between Egypt and Assyria not realizing her fundamental problem of spiritual adultery. And in verse 12, even though Israel, like a dove, tries to flee in rebellion, the Lord will spread his net over them to bring them down like birds of the heaven and discipline them. And in the final image that Israel is compared to in verse 16 is that they're like, treacherous, they're like a treacherous bow or in the NIV, a a faulty bow, which is basically a bow that is useless, right? You try to aim at the target, but once you release the arrow, it always veers off to the side or at a different direction. In reality, it has no direction. And that's what Israel has become, a nation that initially aimed to go in God's direction, but because of their spiritual whoredom, it veered off the path and missed the target. And what is God's just response against their sin? What is God's just response against our sin? But to pronounce his judgment in verse 13 to 16, Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. They speak lies against me. They do not cry out to me, but wail in their beds. Gashing themselves like pagans, they devise against me. And so now their princess shall fall by the sword because of, their insolent, because of the insolence of their tongue. And Israel will be, will be mocked by the Egyptians in the land of Egypt. And so, beloved, in light of hearing the long list of accusations, the Lord reveals, it, reveals that against his people. 
knowing that we too on this side of the cross are prone to wander, right? We're inclined by nature to hate God, to, get, to hate our neighbor just like Israel. And so the question is, what hope is there for us? To whom do we turn to in our hopelessness and failures in the Christian life? But to seek the Lord through Jesus Christ. And that's finally our, in our last but uh, brief point, that we are to realize his rescue to free his people. Because not only does he desire to restore his people, but he actually rescues his people and frees us from sin by entering our sin-cursed world to become human like us, to live the perfect life that we should have lived and to take our place on the cross, beloved. That even though his enemies conspired to end his life like the corrupt kings of Israel, his death did not mean defeat, but a victory over sin and death. So that when he rose again from the dead, he sent his spirit to recreate his people. He recreates them so that spiritual whoredom and rebellion that, we all, that we've just heard, the corruption, would no longer characterize his people, but what? But only love, peace, holiness, mercy, righteousness, and justice, which would mark his people. And so in closing, beloved, may you rest in that truth. May you rest in the Lord's comfort that he renews a people who have received mercy, that he heals our apostasy, and that we as the children of Israel find a renewed desire to seek the Lord and to fear him forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. And although using once again that lovely prayer from John Calvin after he lectured this chapter, grant, Father God, grant Almighty God, that since you see us to be so prone to all the allurements of Satan in the world and at the same time so lacking of judgment, O oh, grant that by your Spirit leading us we may proceed in the right course in which we have already entered under your guidance and directing hand so that we may never go astray from your word nor by any means turn aside from pursuing the mark which you have set before us. And though Satan may attempt to draw us aside, may we yet continue steadfast in your service. And so proceed until we, do, until we arrive at that blessed rest which you have promised to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As our song of response, let it, uh, it's found in number 237, When All Your Mercies, O oh My God. Let us stand to sing number 237.
Beloved, receive now his parting blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Thank you.